Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is the 4 o'clock study, and we are in the book of Daniel. 4 o'clock study, and in Daniel today, Daniel chapter 7, back to 1 through 8 again. I studied it on Monday, going to study it again. There's a lot to this portion of Scripture, and I'd like to share with you another aspect, more facets to this study of Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. Well, in the study we had the other day, we began to explore the meaning and the impact of the four beasts. Control is an interesting concept, and there is this struggle for power. When do you believe that you actually have control over something, over anything, really? Uh, parents, do you have control over your kids? Probably not. I don't think we ever really do. Do you ever have control over your children? What about your work environment? Do you really have control over that? There's a, a great lack of control when it comes to humankind so that we become absorbed with the idea that we want to control and direct almost anything that we become involved with. In fact, this whole COVID-19 issue, this, this crisis, has, has demonstrated that people do not want to lose control. The minute that they thought things were out of control, they rushed the stores and they took all the toilet paper because they didn't want to lose control. Gave them a sense of power having that garage full of toilet paper. In the case of the Babylonian Empire, there were many who desired to control the direction and the outcome of their lives, just like today. People are afraid of the unknown. They don't want to lose their lives. They're afraid, as I posted the other day. They are afraid and have not faced the truth and not made peace with their creator. And so without having that peace, you know, they are out of control. Just how will the events recorded in this book affect our lives? What will it teach us? It'll depend on what we do with the information. Well, let's pray and we'll get into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your holy word. We thank you that we can study it and look at what it means and apply it to our lives. We pray, Father, for the world around us. As we are trying to get back to somewhat normal lives, people are still walking out and around in 90 degree weather with masks on. I thought the heat would kill it, but apparently not. Dear Father, I pray that you would uh, just teach this world something. Teach them something about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's go into a little bit more detail. Chapter 7, 1 through 8. We're going to read it again. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I watched until its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given, given to it. And suddenly another beast, uh, a second, like a bear, and it raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another like a, a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful, terrible, exceedingly strong, and it had huge iron teeth it was devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with the feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Well, here we go. We come back to this dream of Daniel. He saw it in his vision, a great storm on the Mediterranean Sea. We know from the accounts in the news uh, that this must have been uh, quite a, a tsunami. Great waves would have pounded the shoreline. Storm to represent... Uh, storm to rep so, The storm is said to um, 
represent the many wars and rumors of wars that come about because of man's selfish desire to control things. And there will always be wars and rumors of wars. I've said this before. It's all about real estate. People want to be in control of more territory. And so you get a, a, a maniacal emperor, ruler, dictator, who wants to control his land. What does he lust for? More land, more power to control other people. And it's sad. Daniel's given a vision of four beasts that represent four different empires, as we had looked at in at chapter 2. The description we have of these beasts tell us what their mission might be, or would be. There were, they, they were a product of something that sought to rise up and become great in the eyes of the world. The first beast was like a lion, indicating that this emperor, empire was not strong but ferocious. A lion represents the king of beasts on the earth. Such a beast would attack swiftly with great precision. The wings represented um, it, its, its power. It represented uh, its agility and ability to soar above everything, be above everything else. Indication that was once, it was once wild and uncontrollable but would be humili humiliated and would have to surrender its power. The lion represented the Chaldean monarchy that was led by Nebuchadnezzar. Many of Daniel's contemporaries, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, used animals to describe Nebuchadnezzar. He was compared with the lion in Jeremiah 4-7 because of his great power. That he is then called an eagle in Jeremiah 48-40 to spread his wings over Moab to oversee the kingdom. The lion is to be a symbol of strength and courage. Lion, Jesus Christ, the lion of Judah. The wings, like an eagle, indicate his rapid and widespread acquisition of power and the wealth of his empire. The plucking of the wings indica indicates that this empire would be struck down in a great way. And when his mind was taken from him, Nebuchadnezzar he turned animal-like, when his mind was taken from him, he wandered around like a beast, and he ate grass in the fields. Because of Nebuchadnezzar's pride, he relied on his own strength and power, and he had been given a, a heart of a wild beast to teach him what it is to live without the power and direction of God to be like an animal. And you know, people who do not have the direction and, and, and faith in God and to follow after him, because we're made in his image, People who don't follow after God, they begin to act like wild beasts. So the phrase, he was made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to him, meant that he returned to a place of having a heart that would depend on God. And that's how Nebuchadnezzar ended up, and I do believe he came back to God. Nebuchadnezzar became humble and humane because of his experience. It was the intended state which God could reach him. And sometimes we have to be brought low before God can reach us. And it's sad when, when, we, when we get to a low point in our lives so that God can, can reach us and, and help us understand him and we reach out to him and trust in him. The next, next beast was a bear with three ribs in its mouth. The beast represented the Medo-Persian rule in Babylon. Their empire took over. One side of the bear was higher than the other, but it would devour everything that came in its path. Darius the Mede was their chosen representative. We see, we see that when he tried to give Almighty God of Israel recognition, that he was cut short and would lose control to another beast. It would rise up and devour much flesh. The Medes and Persians are, com are compared with a, a bear because of their cruelty and lust to shed blood at any cost. And you know, bears are ferocious animals. A bear attack is horrible. It is said that by Persian law that when a man was convicted of an offense that his whole family and sometimes even his whole community were killed along with him for his crimes in order to wipe out anyone who might have sided with him. Aristotle called the bear an all-devouring animal, ferocious, a terrible beast. When it has the taste for human blood, then that's all a bear will be satisfied with. Once they taste human flesh, that's what they go after. Darius was chosen by Cyrus the Great to take control over Babylon. The third beast 
seen as a leopard with four heads and four wings, indicating agility, speed, but without the same power as the first two beasts. A little bit smaller animal. Alexander the Great would be the one to come and conquer the Babylonians. Yeah, here he comes. Alexander the Great. He comes in to conquer this Babylonian Empire, but he would meet an untimely death, and the empire would be divided between four of his military leaders or generals. We will see more of this empire in chapter 8 as it grows in power. The raised side meant that Persia had the most influence in the kingdom during their rule, and the ribs meant that they would devour anything that came their way. Although weaker than the lion-like beast, it would indicate much damage on the culture and lead many spiritually astray. In the Hebrew, we find that the translation to mean they raised up one dominion over another. The Medes and the Persians formed a united sovereignty, a bond between the two forces to say they would never come against one another. <clears throat> the empires that followed the Medo-Persian rule would not have such an alliance with any other government. And so they would not have any real allies because of their strength and because King Nebuchadnezzar had become humbled, they took advantage of every opportunity to take control. Those three ribs in the mouth of the bear, they are symbolic of just how great the d dominion would be of the cultures in the empire sought, uh, that this empire sought to control. They wanted to control everything that they could. Darius would lead the empire at this particular time to overthrow the Babylonians, uh, Lydia, and the Egyptians. They, he wanted as much as he could. The desire for conquest took this new empire into new territory by sheer force of its military might. The power, the numbers of their military, enormous. The desire for control took man to, discard, took man to a place to discard the will of God. And in the process... Many people lost their souls to eternal condemnation. What is taking place today? People want control of their lives. Well, in order to have your life, you must lose your life, the Bible teaches us. Give it over to God. Give it over to Him. Let Him have control of it. And we have eternal life. What a gift. What we know of the first three phases of the Babylonian Empire teach us of the compelling force that control ha has on us people. You know, it is terrible that, that, that a lust for power takes over in people many, many times. From the very beginning of man, we have had to struggle with the idea that we have a will and a soul that we, are, that we have providence over. We have choices that we can make. I believe that's biblical, that God gives us all choices to make. It is only when people are humbled by the circumstances they find themselves in that they begin to seek the very will of God Almighty. It is sad to me when people think that God controls every aspect of their lives because that would mean that we have no control and that God has chosen everything, even the sinful actions in our life. And I don't believe that God causes us to sin. I don't believe he would choose for us to go the wrong direction. <clears throat> the takeaway on this uh, for today, the struggle for power over our own lives will only hurt our walk with God. When we struggle for power, when we seek to control everything, when we seek not to follow after God, then we lose control. And, and, and you know, it, it's about walking with God. It hurts our walk with Him. If we want control, we really don't have control. But if we place our faith in Christ, Give, give ourselves over to humbly, humbly give ourselves to Christ. And he guides and directs us. And we choose the path that he points us to. Well, we don't lose a whole lot, do we? We get a, we get a very big blessing. We, we as people of faith may unintentionally be dishonest with God by not allowing him to have control over, over our lives. And this is a time to take stock. Are we really following after God or not? What is it that you have a desire to control and are not seeing the blessing of the Lord in? Are you feeling as though the Lord wants to take the lead in some area of your life and it's time that you allow him to do just that? Because that's what God wants from us. What and when is something the Lord has been working out um, for you for, for some time? All we have to do is give it to the leading of God. That's up to us. 
that fourth beast. The more we're going, more to come concerning the fourth phase of the Babylonian Empire in the lessons to follow. I pray that today is a blessing. Um, again, keep keep me in prayer. Keep First Baptist of Farmington in prayer. I am praying for all of you, for all of the churches around the world, that we continue to uh, follow after God and stand strong in the face of adversity, in the face of uh, a government telling us that, that churches, of all things, everything else can open, but you churches... Just sit back and, and don't worry about it. You, you can stream your services. I mean, come on, right? Well, as I've told so many people, there is no substitute for on-site, in-person fellowship. There's no substitute. God calls us not to forsake the assembling together, as so many easily have done today. On the days ahead, I pray that churches will stand as, not as a testimony of fear, but as a testimony of faith in Christ, His Word, and His will. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you give to us. In Christ we pray. Amen. God bless, and I will see you guys tomorrow.